Put your hand on that television set. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He received your healing. Yes. Now. Say it, I take it. I take it. I have it. I have it. It's mine. It's Lord. mine. I thank you and praise you for it. Yes, Lord. And I forgive if I have ought against any. Yes, you do. And I praise you that I'm well and whole. I praise you that I'm well and whole. Yes. According to the word of God. According to the word of God. I'm healed. Yes. And I consider not my own body. Yes, I consider yes. not my own body. I consider not symptoms in my body. I consider not symptoms, symptoms in my body. But only that which God has promised. Only, Only that, that which God, which God has. Only that what the Word has said. Only, Only that, that what the Word has said. And by His stripes I was healed. And by His stripes I am healed now. I'm not the sick trying to get healed. I'm the healed and the devil's trying to give me the flu. That's right. Or whatever else kind of thing he's trying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> healed and well. Yes. In the sweet name, name of Jesus. Of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, entering the kingdom of the cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I am one of the co-hosts here. I am here, as always, with Andrew, Super Sleuth, the Super Sleuth of the show. How are you, man? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. Yeah, so we are in very interesting times. Uh, we are actually here in studio with Melissa Dow Tree. No. Dorty, every time. Why do I always mispronounce no, your name? Every time. Because I will no to mis mispronounce my name because Dorty. Daughtry sounds better than Dorty. So. I always think of that because like that band. It was yeah. the guy Daughtry. 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 I'm yeah. going home. Yes. But yeah. Daughtry. Oh my gosh. So but we're here with Melissa Dorty. Thank you. And you've been on with us before. Yeah. We had a discussion about Bethel and the New Age that came out last year. Mm -hmm. And we are here once again. Glad you could make it here. Uh, you actually made it here before we all get uh, all the travel bans going full effect, Lord yeah. willing. Hopefully I'll be able to go home. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, it, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see where we are by the time even this episode gets released next Tuesday. It's mm -hmm. just the world has changed in the last uh, week and a half. And also we're here with Stephen Bancars. Good to see you, man. Th third time's the charm. Here. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. And we don't actually have to worry because that prayer was made on the TV. So yes. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. We, we received have to, that. We just have to yeah receive it, claim yeah. it, declare right. it. He, his hand was even wet with like oil, or he's washing it for the yes. coronavirus. There's actually no oil. It was just the anointing. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> it was just seeping from his hands. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the con context as far as the audio goes, and uh, we might play the uh, actual video if you guys are watching this on YouTube when it gets uploaded. That was, I believe, yesterday. Kenneth Copeland. Uh, he was standing, declaring victory against the coronavirus. And he was declaring in Jesus' name that we would be protected from sickness. And it's just interesting because you talk about the timing uh, about having a relevant topic right now because we decided, we always want to try whenever we have a guest on, we, we always want to try and pick, like, what's your what's your passion topic? What are you really about? So mm -hmm. when... We had you on with Doreen. That Doreen's passion topic was really to talk about the New Age aspect and her concerns regarding uh, the movement at Bethel. Yeah. And that was a good conversation. And, and it was on both, really both your hearts to really talk about the Word of Faith movement uh, and really talk about those those important issues. I know that's something that's always really been on your heart, Stephen. And so and it just so happens now that we have this worldwide, uh, now it's been declared as a pandemic. pandemic. Yes. And so... The economy is in turmoil. Uh, like you just like right now, and again, it's just people. You go to the news, and you know people are going to freak out. But you look look at the reality of what's happening. You turn on like I, I'm gonna pop on Drudge Report, and <laughs> world on edge, panic after travel ban, system failing, Fed pumps another one trillion, worst day in Wall Street since 1987. Uh, new you have cities right now that are shut down, that are in complete lockdown, travel bans in Europe. I mean, this is. By who knows where we're going to be by the time releases on Tuesday, um, when, when this episode releases. And so what's really intriguing to me as we get into this discussion is that the primary aspects of the Word of Faith movement always focuses around your health and your, pros and your financial prosperity. Those are directly connected 
to your spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens we are in a world where both of those are in incredible turmoil. People are terrified about their health catching this coronavirus. And it's still, no one really knows, but there's all these uncertainties about what actually is going to take place if you catch this. I guess some people are recovering, some people are dying right away. Mm -hmm. there's no, it's just one of those things, like no one really knows is that this is playing out its course. And then you have, right now, if you look at all the grocery stores, um, right now people are lined up, uh, you know, just back, you know, they're just, people are flying, you know, toilet paper's flying <laughs> off the shelves. You know, you have the panic about, you know, now people are trying to buy canned foods. I mean, this is just, I don't think, I don't, I've never seen anything like this so far in my lifetime. I yeah. can even remember. Um, I remember, I, so Y2K, before we jump into this, Y2K, 2000. I remember Y2K, yeah. yeah. People thought that the whole world was going to collapse because of whatever it was, whatever the numbers aligning and stuff like that. And people just, lost. I worked at a grocery store in 1999, New Year's Eve, and people were losing their minds. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you who uh, work in retail, uh we, we uh, are We're praying our, for our you. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, all that being said, this is a very interesting time. What, what do you guys think about this whole, I mean, the timing of everything with this discussion? And also we're going to talk about the connection with a new thought and like the new age, because both of you have backgrounds uh, in that. But I mean, you came from that. Yeah. And now you have ministries directly focused on that area. Just with everything going on and with the relevant topics, like give me your thoughts on like the relevance of like this podcast, especially with everything going on right now. Yeah, I think it's really relevant, especially when you have um, people who are in the Word of Faith community, uh, like Kenneth Copeland. Um, I'm sure we're going to see stuff coming out of, you know, Benny Hinn's mouth and other people such as him. <clears throat> um, you know, Sean Boltz had a prophecy recently mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the coronavirus is going like, to kind of die and fade away. And um, Rodney Howard Brown, another Word of Faith teacher in his church in Florida, um, recently made a declaration and a decree that uh, the entire state of Florida will not be touched by the coronavirus. Right. And yeah. when he was asked, you, well, well, why wouldn't you just make that declaration? If you have a right from God to make like a, an effectual decree on behalf of the entire state of Florida, why not do that for the entire country? Mm. Well, I just, I'm just doing what I'm responsible for kind of thing. Mm. And so um, it, it's important to have an understanding of uh, what exactly are we guaranteed and promised in Christ? Mm -hmm. and also to be able to identify teachings around sickness and around disease and around hysteria that that promote fear, mm -hmm. that don't provide comfort to the soul, mm -hmm. that are false, that are misleading, and that can create suffering, pain, disappointment, brokenheartedness, mm -hmm. uh, a weakened faith. You're basically told if you get, in the word of faith, if you're sick, you're, the problem's your faith. Mm -hmm. It's with you. Right, yeah. it's a spiritual problem. Yep. And if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough, enough faith. And we'll get into all of that. But um, what made this conversation uh, important to me and, and to Melissa as well, I'll, I'll let her speak on that. But for me personally, when I came out of the New Age movement, uh, you know, I was studying the law of attraction. I was trying to practice the law of attraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these same principles that we're going to cover that Word of Faith teachers have been teaching since the early 1900s yeah. right. about man being ontologically Mm -hmm. God by nature. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through primary quotes yeah. from Word of Faith teachers and from New Thought, New Age teachers mm -hmm. showing striking similarities and parallels Big time. between Word of Faith and New Thought, New Age. So this isn't meant to be a discussion, you know, trying to undermine every single Word of Faith doctrine. There's people who are more biblically qualified than, than us mm -hmm. that can do that. Someone like Acosti Hinn, for example, who might be a good guest to have on right. sometime about this topic. But I came out of the New Age, she came out of New Thought, and we're both seeing there's striking parallels between mm -hmm. the Word of Faith movement and the New Thought cults and mm -hmm. the New Age cults that you know we were a part of. Mm -hmm. Little God's Doctrine, the idea that Jesus isn't really that unique, the idea that faith is a force, the idea yep. that you can kind of make positive affirmations and confess your reality into existence with your mm -hmm. words, we're going to get into all of this. Um, but when, what, interested, what interests me about the Word of Faith teachings and the Word of Faith uh, practice is that it's a baptized version of the same thing I was involved in when I was mm -hmm. in the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. You're just slapping the name of Christ on it. Yeah. There's a few differences, mm -hmm. um, but the principles are the exact same. And we're going to prove this with primary quotes. Yeah. So yeah. I'm There's looking forward to that. It comes from like the same yeah. root. Sure. Yeah. And, and this is sort of the area when you talk about how is it relevant to our area of focus. And again, we're we're a show, uh, we're a Christian, we have a show, and it's funny, we always get the reviews that we're like, we're really a cult talking about cults and stuff, and it's like, and people think we have some sort of hidden agenda, but we're always very open about it, like we all, we're, 
we are a show that deals with the world of the cult from a biblical perspective. Yeah. And, and given that we look through a world where neutrality is a myth and that God is the arbiter of truth, that we, the terminology of cult is that any, is any group or any person sitting around one particular person or organization's misinterpretation of the Bible. Yeah. Where they always will use Christian terminology, yes. but the ultimately they deny um, the the nature of Jesus, that he's the eternal God in human flesh. And and even this in this particular case, what you'll see, it's a terminology different. They will use the words Jesus, faith, healing, and they will talk about these particular things. But you'll see, once you see the origins of the, the uh, new thought, and, and, and you see the connection between like word of faith teaching and when you start making these comparisons, that's where you see the similarity and that's when what Walter Martin talks about being familiar with the original. What's what do, what's the biblical basis for this and how do we give a response? Yeah. And I think it's also really good too because especially even now, dealing from a Christian perspective with everything that's going on in the world right now, um, you know, in for in uh, 2 Timothy 1, seven it says, For God has given us a spirit of, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so when we look at what's going on in the world, and, and honestly, we have to think about there's a lot of people right now that have this perspective and have this worldview. So we're not here to bash anyone. We're talking. Mm-hmm. We're here to talk about, we're not here to socialize anything. We're just going to talk about primary sources. But then, then again, you talk about practically, like how do you live, how do you live this out? How do you see the world? Because there's a lot mm. of people. Just for example, we'll we'll talk about one well, like one person for example that's uh, primary when you think of like someone in the in, as far as word of faith goes is Joel Olstein. Mm-hmm. And he always talks about making your declaration. It says who I am, who I say I am. You know, mm-hmm. and you have all these things, and and it just so happens that they just announced that Lakewood Church is shutting down their services. It's going to it's only going to be online. So why aren't they making declar all these people who want to make declarations that I'm free from the coronavirus? They're not doing that. So. It's one of those things where when it, when the rubber meets the road and you have this crisis that is directly connected to how they view the world and theology, like how is this going to affect them? Like it's revealing why? their true colors. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. You know? Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah. They'll say this stuff applies in any and all circumstances, but just so happens when the most important circumstance emerges, well, we're going to shut down our healing rooms now. We're going to shut right? down our services mm-hmm. now. You should be the ones asking people to come in because we're making declarations that nobody is going to get, you know, catch this disease, this virus in Jesus' name. But it, it's really revealing where they actually stand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on one hand, they're, they're hypocrites. They need to be um, addressed as such. But on the other hand, you know, we should kind of applaud them for at least being like, okay, great, you're using some common sense now. <laughs> Like there is a point where you're willing to abandon all this weird, right. fluffy, declaration-based right. Yeah. doctrine that <laughs> lacks biblical precedent. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and we also want to address too in, in this podcast, not just show a parallel, but also what does the Bible say about this topic? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to look at a topic, address it from word of faith teachers, primary sources, new age teachers, primary sources. But what does the Bible say? Because we want to, um, you know, encourage people in the truth, not just show them what error is, but give them the alternative, right? And instruct mm-hmm. them in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Melissa, I kind of want to get a little bit of feedback from you because you were raised in new thought and you actually have some new thought books with you today yeah. you said you have hundreds of new thought yes. new age books on your my, my great home. grandparents were christian scientists so that led us into a lot of weird waters growing up but yeah i have a ton of these books and the ideas in these books are inherently everything that we're talking about you know it's your your health wealth um your your life in general is all determined on your the manifestation of your reality, basically your with thoughts, your, your feelings with your words. And I had no idea this wasn't Christian. I thought that this was higher spirituality. So if you're talking about bringing health and wealth and, you know, things into your world, it's done through your thoughts, feelings, actions. And to me growing up, the reason why I'm passionate about this in particular is because I was more word of faith than I realized because I was really into the law of attraction. I was really into affirmations. Well, not so much affirmations um, as I was into claiming that I was something. You know, I, I, if I wanted money, I was wealthy. You know, I am this, I am that. And it was a thought life that I have adopted at, at that time. And um, like I brought the secret with me. The secret is, uh, you know, where the, the law of attraction, a lot of people would be familiar with this book. Others, not so much. You have these new thought teachers that 
were all over in the 1900s, the 1800s. And like Emmett Fox is one of them. A few people might know who he is. Most won't. And but they they all believe in the same thing. They all say the same things in their books about, you know, if you, tithing, for example, there's a law of tithing. If you if you give 10 percent, then according to the law of tithing, um, the Bible says you must receive that back tenfold. And that reminds us a lot of what we would hear on, you know, these these televangelists. Yeah. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Yeah. And so we find these we find this threaded together in these books and these teachings and they call themselves Christians. They they say that this is the this is what the Bible teaches. And then you have word of faith teachers who change it a little bit. It's not exactly the same, but the the premise of what they're saying and what they're doing inherently is a new thought. So when I saw this happening, when I when I came out of the new thought and get into, you know, counter cult ministry, I see all of these teachers uh, in, in Christianity teaching what I see to be law of attraction based like Joel Osteen. We, Joel Osteen, some people might love him, but what he teaches inherently is the law of attraction. Mm-hmm. He's talking about your best life now and um, the power of I am. Everything about that premise is new thought, law of attraction. You, you know what's interesting about what's happening right now in our society, especially with the coronavirus, you're saying when it, when it all comes down to it. This is what they practice. This is what they preach. Mm-hmm. The truth is, is that's that's true because they separate themselves in the times where they say they actually have this power. They're going to close their church, distant themselves from the sick, and yet still try to speak something into existence, yet not being right with it. It's like a spiritual pushback. Yeah, you, you see, it's like, God, it's like their bluff is being called almost. When when they're suffering in the world, or when there's something that's happening out of your control, you actually find out where people's faith truly lies. Yes. And yeah. like that, that's the situation that we're getting into. Like we heard Kenneth Copeland in the beginning giving that declaration. He's using words like faith or healing. But what exactly does he mean by that? And we're going to be getting into that today. Yeah. And it's something totally different than what we would think in Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. Stephen hit on it earlier by saying a force. But yeah, we're going to get into that. And I think it's really interesting, especially the signs of the times right now. You'll see by people's practices where their faith actually lies. It's going to strip away mm-hmm. the the supposed Christian uh, exterior and you will see truly what they mean yeah. by right. their actions. Right. And it's interesting because if you look at the history of the yes. Word of Faith movement, yeah. um, it seems as though there's some primary fathers mm-hmm. of the Word of Faith movement, right. which would be Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, and William Branham, maybe another one or two. But then you also have the grandfather, like the unanimous grandfather mm-hmm. yep. of the Word of Faith movement, which would be uh, Essek William Kenyon, yep. who was a Baptist minister, mm-hmm. but who was surrounded by metaphysical influence um, at the university he went to. In Boston during the time yeah. of like the massive New Thought movement. Yes. And he studied this stuff and he had an extensive metaphysical library and yeah. um, it undoubtedly influenced his thoughts, his teachings, and he is someone that <clears throat> Hagen plagiarized yeah. over and over and over again. We can document that. Like Hagen would have these visions right. where he, said, he claims that he went to heaven, he saw Jesus. Mm-hmm. But then what Kenyon ends up teaching out of that is literally word for word, word, for word taken from a, a Kenyon book. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's many examples of this. But Kenyon himself, who was influenced by people like Mary Baker Eddy and Phineas Quimby, who are you know the founders of New Thought, right. influenced Kenyon. Kenyon then influences Hagen who is really the the modern father right. of the Word of Faith movement, um, starting an official Word of Faith denomination. I think it was the early 70s. Yeah, yeah. Or late 70s. Like 79 or 72 or 79. Yeah, or and starting, uh, you know, Rama Rama Bible College. And, you know, we're not saying that everyone who attends these colleges isn't saved or everyone who follows Hagen isn't saved or that, you know, if you identify as Word of Faith, you're on your way to hell. Um, but these are dangerously misleading people teachings. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I would say that there are some teachers in the Word of Faith movement, some of whom we're going to be talking about today, where the quotes that they have said are so blasphemous Mm -hmm. and so heretical. People can make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. I I think we would unanimously agree that they're in danger of hellfire. Oh yeah. For the things that they're saying. You cannot be a born again believer, born of the Spirit, born of the same Spirit that wrote the Bible and Mm -hmm. say things that contradict it in very major ways that are black and white in scripture. Mm-hmm. Where's the fear of God in their eyes? Yeah. And yeah. The way they handle scripture. Well, then if the spirit's, spirit of God is in you, there it's almost like how can you be saying these things if you're getting direct revelation from God and it's going against what you even see in his word? And 
what you're saying aligns more with new thought teachings, metaphysical new thought teachings than what you would ever see in the Bible. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's where I cry foul personally. Yeah. And I thought about Kenyon. So Kenyon, yes, he, he, he would deny that he ever had any involvement in the metaphysical cults. Like he, he denounced them. So it's interesting because he would, he didn't even consider himself a Pentecostal, but the word of faith movement did start in Pentecostalism. Like if you're really going to do your homework and go back, it started with Pentecostals. Branham and Lake. Yes. And people like that. So it didn't really start in the new thought metaphysics. It was influenced by it. So you Mm -hmm. had people like Kenyon. Kenyon's the one who really was, it's like he was the tiny tip of the bigger iceberg. He had, right. he had small things that were out of whack that turned into much bigger things. And um, that's really how it all started. But people would argue about Kenyon being influenced directly by Christian science or right. Quimby. When in, but it's de- demonstrably, you could just read what he wrote and yeah. simply see the connection that like little gods. Yeah. And, and positive confessions, things mm-hmm. like this, that were mirrors of what you would see in New Thought. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt, you right. could see that there's a connection there, even though he would not connect himself at all with the metaphysical cult. Mm-hmm. So some people I know in the uh, Pentecostal uh, Pentecostals or even hyper hyper charismatic movement would argue that Kenyon was legit. And he's not. <laughs> I mean, if you read his writings, they're going to match up to what we're seeing from Hagen, which I'm sure that they would revert to. Uh, look at with with respect and but that's what we're going to show is how it's paralleled with what we see in new thought Mm -hmm. and it all started with Kenyon. yeah Yeah. it lacks biblical parallel but it does have new thought new age parallel yes Yes. so Kenyon can say and people who want to defend Kenyon can say well he had no influence from the metaphysical cults okay show me what he's saying in scripture you Mm -hmm. can't but I can show you what he's saying in The Secret yeah, or in exactly. some of these works from Quinius Femby we're going to yeah. be quoting today. Yeah. Right. And here's a thought, too. It's like, um, you know, when Jesus says, you know, you will know a tree by its fruit. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you know, the, the, the ultimate root of something by the fruit right. that is produced out of it mm-hmm. immediately in the 70s when Hagen started his word of faith denomination. You had very solid Christians, uh, Dave Hunt, mm. um, John. Ackenberg, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, who were immediately within like two years writing books, renouncing and responding to this, holding conferences where they're having debate panels, right. warning people about the word of faith teachings, about their metaphysical lineage. Even Walter Martin. Yeah. Even Walter Martin. Yeah. So how is it that that's the fruit of a move of the spirit of God, right? Mm. Because they believe just like, um, you know, new thought teachers believe that their ultimate source and origin for their information is revelation knowledge, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. they're having some kind of spiritual transmission given to them in their spirit man, and it's manifesting in these new teachings, and mm-hmm. they've been called to be the pioneers. Why would we believe that people such as, you know, Hagen or even Copeland, who always talks about the conversations mm-hmm. he has with the Lord, and mm-hmm. I want you to teach people this, and um, they're receiving it through kind of the same uh, general mechanism, revelation knowledge, some secret special yes. knowledge that I received. Mm-hmm. And now you have to come to me to get it now. Yep. But okay, well, let's test the fruit of it. The fruit of it, instant division and confusion. You have 70% of the body of Christ who's like, that is completely unbiblical. And then you have 30% who's like, well, there's some truth to it. Or maybe it's even like 33, 33, 33, 33, where you have some are saying, yeah, I can see some of it. Some are, I say, no, see none of it. And some say, yeah, I see all of it. Like, how is that the fruit of a, the move of God when a fruit of the spirit in scripture, one of thing, the things that pleases the heart of God the most is when people who are in his bride can come together in unity. Amen. That pleases God. He loves yeah. that. You know, in Psalms, it talks about brothers dwelling in unity. It's like mm. anointing oil dripping down the beard. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's beautiful though. And right. it's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Like, like we all have different views. We can yeah. come together and serve around, you know, the gospel yes. and serve around yeah. the cross yeah, and, yeah. and worship around an altar together mm-hmm. and just love on the Lord and love on people. But immediately when these word of faith teachers who apparently hear from God directly, the immediate fruit of it is division, confusion, books being written by very yeah. solid Bible scholars. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that Walter Martin always did too, is that he always <clears throat> sought unity on the essentials. And that's one of the things he did too in his ministry back in uh, California when he found the Christian Research Institute is that he worked with a lot of the churches and he just said, we need to figure out the essentials because the kingdom of the cults, this is where, this is the ground zero there. And we need to really move, mobilize and, and, and find out and work off of what we have common and, and because this is just a huge 
almost like an it was like a pandemic of cultism like in this mm-hmm. in the 70s yes. we're gonna we're gonna speak in par- a little par- uh, parables a little bit 70s. but um what is really intriguing with me and just with some of the books that kind of we've read in preparation for this and i've noticed this just with the discussion when it comes to uh the hyper charis- hyper you call it like, i guess hyper charismania or just looking at the Pentec- some of the uh hyper Pentecostal movement or just some of these word of faith movements when, movement teachers when it comes especially originating from the 1900s mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. when you look at the when you look at like rev, the, our, a Christian view of revelation is one of the best arguments against the world the kingdom of the cults because every single cult always starts off of a private revelation mm-hmm. whether it's Joseph Smith whether it's Mary Baker Eddy or whether it's uh, Charles Taze Russell, they always have some special, their own private revelation, or they have a special insight or ability to interpret the Bible that no one else has. And they have to basically be the mediator in which to interpret the Bible for someone else. Yeah. And so what you see, however, in the, with the Christian worldview is that you have the Bible, which is a reliable collection of historical documents that's written by, that, that was written by eyewitnesses who saw supernatural events and fulfillment of specific prophecy these are all publicly eyewitness accounts and and historical documentation so you have a public accounting and a revelation that's verified Mm -hmm. um and so you have so that's where you have a uh, with with the christian worldview versus these cults these counterfeit movements that come out what was particular to me and this doesn't mean that every single person in the word of faith movement. we're not saying that every single one of them are cult leaders but what is alarming though is that the authority and the acclaims were by which they are establishing these doctrines, they always seem to be, there's there's language that's used about restorationism. This is sort of like a restoration of lost things. Yeah. Um, and that's the area where it's alarming because you're, and, e- and even, just, even though, just to kind of bring Bethel into the conversation, I remember just for example, because I mean, they, they're part of this whole group. They are. Um, is that when, it was back when we were doing the preparation for the Bethel and New Age podcast, mm-hmm. I believe is in the physics of heaven. One of the chapters that Bill Johnson had wrote, which was alarming to me when he talked about, there are these mantle, there's all these yes. uncovering these like hidden mantles and anointings. I'm like, is this sort of like a legend, like the legend of Zelda. I tell you, it's like le- <laughs> the, the legend of Zelda. Where you have to go to these like hidden dungeons to find these like mantles. And you're yeah. like, Link is like, da 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 da. You like, you found this mantle or something. Yeah. But in all seriousness, like that's, that's what's alarming. So instead of, because the ultimate standard, like how we detect a, a counterfeit versus an original, we always go go back to the word source. We we have to go to the Word of God mm-hmm. and test test all things, and we know we know what is a counterfeit by studying the original. But what they're doing is that we're not going to the original. We're we're going to some hidden source, some hidden knowledge, and that's and that's what that's the aspect that that's alarming in all this. And that's just something that need, people need to be aware of. When you study the origins of this movement, yeah, th- th- there's a reason for it too, and Stephen was hitting on it. And this is a good base, I think, where we can start to help people to understand exactly, uh, like the root of uh, the connection between new thought and the word faith movement. And Stephen was talking about this this wisdom and also revelation. So there's a relationship between the material and the spiritual, mm-hmm. and how they actually relate to the importance, and how one can actually manipulate the other. Yeah. So in the new thought movement. Uh, Melissa, for for example, can you describe how the spiritual realm or this 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 uh this realm that you can get tapped into, you can actually use you know by your words or affirmations, you can change the physical reality. Well, the main premise of when you're in the new thought and even new age, this is something they have in common. I mean, to kind of give the difference between the new mm-hmm. thought and new age. By the way, new age is. I, I usually say the new thoughts like the cousin or like stepsister of new age. It's right. the same thing. Um, and they're very much related, but at the core it's that you're divine, you know? And so if, if you're ha- if you have this inner divinity, which is what all new thought teachers teach, you are divine. You have, you're a little God, you're godlike, And as such, because you're made in the image and likeness of God, you can manipulate the world around you. You can manipulate your reality through your thoughts, words, and feelings. Right. And the way to do that, and the reason why, is because you are are divine. So exactly. That's the thought process. So the what I do to you, I do to myself, which is the law of attraction, like attracts like. 
So that's why a lot of New Agers and people that are caught up in the New Thought do kind of have a sense of, I don't know, a false peace, I want to call it, mm -hmm. because they stay out of the um, the mix, so to speak. They don't, they don't want to be involved in things that would mess up their reality. Mm -hmm. So in this aspect, you have teachers that say, don't, don't think negative things. Don't say negative things. Don't say you're sick. That, no, that's not true. Do not declare that you are sick. Don't, don't say you're broke. No, you are rich. You have wealth. You have health. You have joy. You have happiness. All this stuff. And speak that. And out of those words will become your reality. It, yeah, it can manipulate the physical reality it's, through yes. this wisdom that you have obtained. So, so Stephen, in the word faith movement, what's, what's the relation to that? Yeah, um, it, there's a bunch of different ways that they will. It's a bunch of doctrines that each play a role in fulfilling that mechanism of, okay, why is it that when I speak my words, they have the ability to produce change in the physical world? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to say one because a few spiritual laws, which we'll get into, um, one because of the power of positive confession, one because right. we're, we're little gods by nature. And um, I think there'd be an interesting place to, to start looking at comparisons here mm -hmm. um, because there's a whole bunch of, it, it, it's hard to um, appreciate the parallels unless we break down each individual idea mm -hmm. because the word of faith teachers, they mm -hmm. usually kind of mishmash them all together. Yeah. Um, and they don't, there's not like a systematic theology book for word of faith teachings. Yeah. <laughs> right. But when you begin to, to actually analyze them and say, okay, like categorically, what are you saying about man's ontology? What are you saying about the nature of faith, mm -hmm. right? What are you saying about the incarnation of Jesus, mm. right? What are you saying about the nature of positive confession and, and the spoken word? Mm -hmm. um, when you actually break it down kind of systematically, that's when you're able to get clarity because you can see, wow, there's a very clear parallel here between what they're teaching yeah. and what is taught in, in, in uh, the occult, what's taught in New Thought, what I was exposed in in the New Age movement. Um, so, for example, I want to quote from some uh, Word of Faith teachers. These are all primary quotes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to name the names of the teachers, and uh, people can listen to this and deci decide for themselves whether or not they think this is orthodox and uh, people we want to be listening to. And also just to note that some people might be sometimes get bothered or upset when like names are named. And but the reality is, is that we are you don't ever want to have a standard of a piety that's higher than God's or, or, or that's higher than the Bible. And the reality is, is that. Paul name names. Yep. Well, that, um, and they're publicly saying this. Right. So, I mean, this <laughs> is very easy. To just, they're very, it's yeah. very easy to just go and listen to this. It's not like they're trying yeah. to hide it. Mm. You yeah. Know? Like, you know, Paul talks about Hymenaeus and uh, what's the other guy? Hymenaeus and uh, what's the I'm other guy? I'm not going to try to pronounce the name, bro. <laughs> uh, I know I know the name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it. But I, he says, I've, I've handed them over to Satan so they may not learn not to blaspheme. So he names people by names. Yeah. And he, he did that multiple times. So there is sometimes there is a biblical precedent for that. Um, that's what I want to state, but go ahead. Yeah, and it's also not to just, like, I'm not concerned about one man like Kenneth Copeland. Like, if his ministry doesn't exist anymore, he can go work a regular job. Mm -hmm. What I'm more concerned about is how many hundreds of thousands of people are giving money to his ministry, are um, believing these teachings, and are being hurt as a result. Mm -hmm. Amen. Having their bank account strained as a result, having their walks with God stifled, or confused, yep. um, missing the mark in their in their devotional life and their walk with God because they're believing in a and participating in a form of Christianity that is not biblical Christianity. Mm. You can't bury yourself into in, in a room and read the Bible cover to cover a hundred times and come out saying yes. these things these word of faith teachers are about to say yes. here. Mm. Right? You can't have an organic reading of Scripture, a pure, honest, just exegetical um, exposition of the Word of God, mm -hmm. and come out saying these things that they're saying. And, and, and the thing is, they're not claiming this is necessarily coming from the Word of God. Half the time they're claiming this, this, claiming this came from special revelation, from yeah. visions, dreams. I was talking to the Lord one time. Okay, well, no wonder it doesn't sound like anything <laughs> Scripture is saying because God never said it, right? Yeah. And so um, I'm, not, I'm not saying every single person here is necessarily going to hell as of today or if they've already died, that they're in hell right now. That's not the point. Mm. I'm not like whether or not we want to categorize these people as this or that, that's secondary. Like just people can listen to these quotes for themselves and decide, is this someone who is reliable or unreliable? Mm -hmm. That's all we need to establish. Are they trustworthy or untrustworthy? Well, you're saying he's a wolf and he's actually not. He gave all this money to, you know, people in Africa or something. Well, whether he gave money or not, whether he's a wolf or not is irrelevant. Is he trustworthy? Mm -hmm. Do these quotes demonstrate qualifications for overseership 
as given in the pastoral epistles, namely being above reproach and being able to teach. Mm. So people can make their own decisions. Love it. Earl Polk, <clears throat> word of faith teacher, Adam and Eve were placed in the world as the seed and expression of God. Just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. Mm. When God said, let us make man in our image, he created us as little gods. Mm. But we have trouble comprehending this truth. We see ourselves as little people with very little power and dominion. Until we comprehend that we are little gods and begin to act like little gods, we cannot manifest the kingdom of God. Here's Kenneth Hagin. Man was created on equality with God, and he could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. God has made us as much like himself as possible. He made us in the same class of being that he is himself. Here's Casey Treat. This is unbelievable. Mm. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost had a conference, and they said, let us make man as an exact duplicate of us. An exact duplicate of God. Say it out loud. I am an exact duplicate of God. Come on, say it. Say it again. I am an exact duplicate of God. When God looks in the mirror, he sees me. When I look in the mirror, I see God. You know, some people say to me when they're mad, you just think you're a little God. You got that right. Who do you think you are? Jesus. Or sorry, who do you think you are? Jesus? Yep. Are you <sighs> listening to me? Since I am an exact duplicate of God, I'm going to act like God. Wow. Benny Hinn, in reference to the creation story, God came from heaven and became a man. He made man little gods. And here's a few from Quopel. And I want to be exhaustive here so people can see mm -hmm. it's not just one teacher. Mm -hmm. It's all of them. Mm-hmm. It's not just one quote, one time, source material. This is going to be coming from uh, a, a sermon called Praise the Lord that aired February 6th, 1986. Then we're going to see one coming from uh, a tape called Following the Faith of Abraham, uh, uh, tape number 013001. People can go look this up for themselves. Here's mm -hmm. the first one. Man was created in the God class. He was not created in the animal class. He is in the God class. He has a uniqueness about him that even angels do not have, and that is... And that is the God, the God-given right to choose his own words and speak them, thereby setting his own divine destiny, his own destination. Are we gods? We are a class of gods. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. Adam was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God, even. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. He was God's very image, the very likeness. Everything he did, everything he said, every move he made was the very image of Almighty God. You see, Adam was walking as a God. Adam walked in the God's class. Adam did things in the class of God's. So Ugh. what are your first impressions before we look at what the Bible has to say in a couple New Age parallels? What are your guys' first impressions of, of, of hearing that? It's, uh, it's pretty intense. When you hear something like that, it makes you squirm. Yeah. Because I believe in a creator-creature distinction. You know, there's there's a reason why I was created, and it wasn't to be God or to have the voice of God, to have that type of rule and control over this world. No, it was to serve him mm -hmm. and to do it for the reasons and purposes he created me. See, I see, I hear that. I see that how can you actually have a good understanding of what the fall of man and sin was in itself? If you think that you were created as, as like the same class as God's. See, and this is the basic premise in every book that you read, every new thought book, new age. Again, the premise is that you're divine and it's more than you're just divine. You are God. And yeah. if you're going to fall in the same class and suit as God, then you can do the same things he did. Right. Which is why they claim these things. If you're going to heal like God healed, well, you can because you're a little God. Mm. You have the same power. You have the same abilities that Jesus had. And this is again, inherently new thought. I was taught that we could walk on water. If we had enough faith, we could do exactly what Jesus did. We could raise the dead. We could heal the sick. We could walk on water. We could, we could manipulate the reality around us by walking through walls. Yes. Like crazy things. So, so, so it'd be like, since we're created in the God class, that spiritual level is yes. so much more powerful than the material world around us. By understanding it, you can manipulate that reality. I want you to quote, are you are a co-creator, right? I want to yeah. quote Kenyon real quick, just because he he's like the the root of where yeah. they get their stuff from. He says this in um the Father and His Family pages thirty two and thirty three. He says, in other words, when man was created, he was made as near like deity as it was possible for mm. deity to create him. Man belongs to God's class. 
So we've got Hagen and Copeland. Where did they get this idea from? Kenyan. They got it from mm-hmm. Kenyon. Mm-hmm. Where did Kenyon get this idea the from? The metaphysical. The metaphysical. Because yeah. yeah. there yeah. has to be a reason and a purpose mm-hmm. to be part. Because it didn't come from the Bible. You right. have, there's a reason why you have to be in the same class as God. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or you can't do what he does. And like just for example too, talking about just uh, source quotes and the, ri- the origins of this and in the connection to metaphysics is that here's a quote by Phineas Quimby. Mm. He, he says, and you can I just <laughs> I, like I want to look at your face. If you're like oh like, oh, like anything, your alarm yeah, goes off. Quimby is Quimby is. But the... I just want to just throw this out, and you'll see a comparison here in a second. Um, so he says he says my theory: the trouble is in the mind, for the body is only the house for the mind to dwell in. If your mind has been deceived by some invisible enemy into a belief. You have put it into the form of a disease, with or without your knowledge. By my theory or truth, I come in contact with your enemy and restore you to health and happiness. So mm. for those that don't know, Phineas, okay, what Kenyon is to the Word of Faith movement, Phineas Quimby times 10 is what was, is the father of the New Thought movement. Mm-hmm. Right. So everything th- that we see that has trickled down since Phineas Quimby is what we see in the New Thought movement. I was always told that this was a timeless spiritual truth that it went all the way back to you know the mayans and before jesus and right. all this stuff you know it went back to the garden is where it went back to mm. it started there that you can wow. be like god mm. and so whenever i realize that there's oh wow there's a beginning to this right you know it started with quimby yeah and so then yeah okay mm. well when we're going to these historical origins and some yeah. people might have their hands crossed yeah, uh, sitting in their in their quarantined home. By the time you listen to this, um, stay Man. safe out there. We mean it's it's we got just rolled the punches and God is sovereign and we're just we're just here Amen. just taking this one day at a time. But um, you know, you look at this like how what's what's the so what? And I just want to say this real quickly is that when you look at the relevance of what's being taught in this movement, mm-hmm. and then you look at for example, just in comparison to uh, Joel Osteen and <laughs> um, like just but like Joel Osteen, just a couple of quotes from a. Uh, your best life now, just talking about the comparison of uh, new thought and, mm-hmm. and and the origins of this, and especially relevant to like what people are experiencing right now with this pandemic and whatever is whatever is going whatever is moving forward. I mean, this is people really don't know, and people are scared. But just for example, you, here's a couple quotes from your best life now. He says, uh, "If you develop an imagery of success." Uh, of if oh, I'm sorry, if you develop an image of victory, success, success, health, abundance, joy, peace, and happiness, nothing on earth will be able to hold these things from you. And then he said, this is another quote. He says, the scripture says that God wants to pour out quote his far and beyond favor. God wants this to be the best time of your life. But if you are going to receive this favor. You must enlarge your vision. And just one more quote. And here's just one more quote. And I want to get your thoughts on this, Melissa, and we can all just jump in here. Yeah. Uh, Olsen also says here, the scripture says that God wants to, quote, his uh, pour out his far and beyond favor. Um, yeah, he's kind of saying the same thing. God wants to be, God wants this to be the best time of your life. But if you are going to receive this favor, you must enlarge your vision. You can't go around uh, uh, thinking negative defeated mm. limiting thoughts mm-hmm. so let's just think about so let's just think about this right now someone is following joel's things teachings uh their 401k is being wiped out all of a sudden their hours went from for their work in the hotel industry and or the travel industry and their hours just went from 40 hours a week down to 10 hours a week and all of a sudden they're thinking well, I'm trying to think this thing. What like what's wrong with me? A lot of it has. This to is do... where this is where we're getting to the discussion about yeah. about theology hurting people. Yes, and this is why it's relevant. No, the so with in the new thought, if you're going to take something like a circumstance like that, a lot of times the the goal, and this is what Eckhart Tolle would teach. By the way, for people who know who he is, he's a well known new thought author in cahoots with Oprah. They're BFFs. Um, so is Joel Osteen and Oprah. By the yep. way, they're they she approves of his, of his teaching that should tell you something the basic premise is that if that were to happen it's your thought life a that attracted that to you b right. the way to make that stop and go away is to become mindless in a way not think about that it's it's more about changing the pattern of way of the way you're thinking so your circumstances don't necessarily um mean your circumstances do not have to control your thought life. Deny your senses. Deny your senses. Search for a higher wisdom. Yes. And manifest that into reality yes. because your wisdom can manifest things and, into this and material anything world. Anything else, it, it is your fault. 
Right. I mean, uh, that's basically what it teaches is if something bad, negative, horrible happens to you, you somehow brought that into your life. Right. And the first thing you should do is not think about how, like, what else you can do to bring that in there. So mm-hmm. if, if you're thinking about if, if the world literally does revolve around you, which is what it teaches. Yeah. Right. Um, you are successful. You are wealthy. You are this. You are that. And you are at the center of this universe. Everything that happens in your universe is subjective. Mm-hmm. So sickness doesn't have to be a part of your universe. This is why I don't see a lot of New Agers doing much about, you know, donating, for example, to, you know, children in Africa. Um, that doesn't have to exist in your reality. Pandemics are not part of your universe. Pandemics are not a part of your universe. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Mm. So it's like if, if there's yeah. something is right now, so many people are feeling a lot of false peace. Um, I feel peace because God is sovereign and in control. And no matter what happens, right. you know, um, I don't have to control that, though. I, I don't have to have any sort of responsibility with that. Whereas if you're in the new age, if, if you have that belief, you are in control because you're God. Yeah. That's your responsibility. If you're not right. putting out that energy, if you're not emitting something. I remember one time laying on my um, uh, living room floor. There was fires going on. I think it was here or in California. It was a while ago. Mm-hmm. But it was awful, like the awful fires. I remember meditating on my floor, mm. um, willing it to leave my reality. Mm. You know, it, it's it's that kind of... See this. This is the thing. Like the the word of faith response is the same response as the new thought when they're suffering <laughs> in troubles. It's the reason why you are still sick is that you have a lack of faith. Basically, right. So yeah. we we've, we've heard with people that have come on our shows that have come come out of the Jehovah's Witnesses the same thing when they're having an issue. What's the issue? The issue is with you. There's no understanding. Pray more. Right. There's no understanding of suffering at all in the light of God's sovereignty. Yes. In what faith is is actually having faith and trusting in God yes. and His promises. There's, there's none of that because when you actually have faith demonstrated in the word faith movement, it's faith in yourself and faith in your own words yes. as being a force that can manifest this reality. So when the world starts crumbling down, you find that your faith was never placed in the creator. It was in you yourself. only had it in yourself. And yes. what does Jesus say about ourselves? He says, you need to die to yourself, <laughs> pick up your cross and follow me, yeah. which means submit yourself to his word, mm-hmm. his teaching as the creator of the universe, distinct, separate Mm-hmm. from us the objective standard overall yeah because if you don't do that you'll actually never understand it in the first place because when the light of these pandemics happen where are you now where are you now it, it, that's why i think that these things happen for more of a they expose the church they expose people to what they actually believe mm-hmm. um we were talking about that before we got on and with the little god so steve you do have quotes here from new thought teachers right so we have the, we have the word of faith teachers saying that we're basically little gods that were divine. Yeah. And it's directly paralleled to what we see taught by new thought teachers. There is a slew of books. It's so easy to show that this is exactly what they believe. But for the general audience that may not know this, um, we do have quotes from many well-known, some not well, so well-known. Um, it's just so easy to, to find uh, quotes. Yeah, and just everything that was just talked about there um, is really, it really boils down to man's ontology. The reason why your faith yep. has significance, the words you speak have significance, is because you're God by nature. Mm. When God created Adam, he reproduced himself. And therefore, just like, um, you know, God is an I am, Kenneth Copeland has said, you know, when I see, see God saying I am in scripture, I just smile and say I, I am too, too. Oh, right? Because I'm a reproduction of God. You know, as uh, Creflo Dollar says, you know, everything produces after its own kind. That's not even what the Bible says. Reproduces is what it says. Um, God didn't need to reproduce anything. Right. Mm. Um, I can produce lots of things as a human. It doesn't mean everything I'm producing is, I can produce a water bottle. Everything doesn't produce after, I'm not producing a human when I produce a water bottle. But, uh, you know, because everything produces after its own kind, when God created man, he created gods. And everyone, you can, t- you can tell people in the audience are like, no, please, that sounds horrible. And they're like really skeptical. But this is a, a universal word of faith doctrine that goes back to Kenyon. It goes back to Hagen. And um, this is why uh, it's extremely concerning is because it's universal among word of faith teachers and new age teachers, new thought teachers. Here are some quotes. Here's Neil Donald Walsh. He, he wrote a, a, a series of books called uh, Conversation with God. Conversations with God or Friendships yep. with God had sold over 10 million copies, this uh, series of books. You are quite literally the word of God made flesh. Compare that with Kenneth Copeland saying Adam in the garden was the word made flesh. Right. Deepak Chopra, those who have knowledge of God are gods. 
Rhonda Byrne, the author of The Secret, which has mm-hmm. sold 26 million plus copies, you are God in a physical body. It's the exact same thing we're seeing from these Word of Faith teachers. Um, here is a book called uh, The Course in Miracles. Once again, this has sold millions and millions of copies, has been pushed by Oprah Winfrey, has been pushed primarily by someone named Marianne Williamson, a New mm-hmm. Thought teacher who has six number one New York Times bestselling books and was a presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. Um, she ended up dropping out. But the recognition of God, this is A Course in Miracles, the recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. Here's another new thought teacher named Scott Peck. God is within us. We are part of God all the time. And here's a quote from uh, Maitreya, which is believed to be an entity that a guy named Benjamin Cream was channeling. Benjamin Cream is a part of a, a an occultic school of thought called Theosophy, mm-hmm. started by Helena Blavatsky back in the late 1800s. She was actually the first one to coin the term law of attraction. Mm-hmm. So while she was more of like an esotericist and more of like a dark occultist mm-hmm. and more of a Luciferian, yeah. she adopted new thought principles as well. And here's a quote coming from, down that lineage from Benjamin Cream, who believed that he was in contract with My- Maitreya, who is this entity who is called the Christ. It's a very unique relationship, they think, that Jesus of Nazareth had with this other entity named the Christ. Mm -hmm. They believe that Jesus wasn't the Christ. Maitreya was, and Maitreya overshadowed Jesus. Avatar. Yes. And so Maitreya has said this. My friends, God is nearer to you than you can imagine. God is yourself. God is within you and all around you. And this is what I thought, this is what I believed. Mm -hmm. The New Age teaches pantheism. That's where a distinction that we would want to make between New Thought, New Age, and Word of Faith. Right. Um, They would teach, New Age and New Thought teach pantheism, that everything is divine, Mm -hmm. like this water bottle's God by nature, Mm -hmm. right? Word of Faith teachers won't say this water bottle's God by nature, but they say man is. Right. So it's like a selective pantheism, essentially. Now, when it comes to a biblical response to this, like what does the Bible actually say? Like, okay, Mm -hmm. They're saying that we're, we are little gods and we're running around as a bunch of like, you know, recreations of God in the garden. Um, Isaiah 43.10, yeah. before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Boom. So no God was formed before or after Yahweh, uh, which would include in the garden of Eden. Uh, Psalm 90 verse 20, put the, I use this one so much in ministry because it, it's such a prevalent topic in the new age movement, the deity of man. Mm-hmm. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Here's Isaiah 31, verse 3. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. Um, Acts 10, verse 26. When people fell, the guard fell at the feet of Peter because he saw that he, the prison doors were open and the chains fell off. Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I, too, am a man. I'm but a man. I'm but a man. Right? And what's interesting is the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, the king of Babylon yep. in Isaiah 14, and King Herod in Acts 12, these are the only people that tried to claim and wear deity for themselves mm. in scripture. So we see what, and they were all issued the capital punishment by say, God I himself. Say, what happened to them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The biblical precedent for divinity claimers is capital punishment. Mm. And, well, and the Antichrist. I mean, with this, <laughs> depending on our, our eschatology. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. But the point is, is that uh, if God wanted us walking around thinking we are ontologically mm-hmm. God by nature and that we are little gods, he would mm-hmm. set a, a biblical precedent, yeah. a better biblical pres- <laughs> bi- biblical precedent yeah. than capital punishment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it's just yeah. interesting when you're mentioning these quotes and talking about scriptures to refute it. I mean, our, our if you guys look into our archives, like our primary bread and butter our focus has been mormonism Mm -hmm. just because that's just been our primary area of ministry like apology at church uh was founded originally was originally apology of christian ministries which is pretty much a focus and outreach on the cults primarily reaching out to mormons and also jehovah's witnesses Mm -hmm. and different cults but that was primarily the focus and in all the times of ministering to them they have belief that they can become a god one day Mm -hmm. um and not necessarily that i mean they believe that they're children of god that they're the spirit children not necessarily that they're they have like they're divine in the sense the word of faith it's different it's a different ballpark but it's still it still falls in the same category still same essence yeah it's still the same essence and so just for example two ways to also refute the distinction between the uh we're us being the in, in the image of god the imago dei there's a different there's a difference between the Imago Dei versus actually being divine. And that's I think that's sometimes what people fail to grasp when they're in this movement. But even the two additional verses that has always come to mind that I always use, and it's all when you talk with Mormons who believe that one, that God is a man and we can become like him. 
Um, but this is also would be relevant to this area of discussion too. Uh, the first one is Hosea 11:9, and I always like I originally memorized this in King James because like back then they've obviously become a lot more liberal. They just would always kind of want the King James English. So I just I, I always like saying in King James English, but it, it, you get the same idea. Um, in the this is what God says in Hosea uh, Hosea 11:9. He says, "I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man." the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. But you see right there in the middle of that verse, you see, I am God and not man, the mm-hmm. Holy One in the midst of thee. So you see a distinction between God and man right there. And then also Numbers 23, 19 Love it. says, God is not a man that he should lie, mm-hmm. nor the Son of man that he should repent. He has said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he not spoken? Or shall he not make it good? Yep. So again, you just see right there, they're making a distinction. He's saying that God is not God is not a little God. Mm-hmm. God is not a man. There's a distinction. And There's two, that, two different classes of being. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Not not different beings of the same class. Right. Like these people are trying to teach us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think one of the biggest distinctions is the fact that in Adam we all die. Regardless of what you think about the essence of your nature, can you stop your death? Well, I know one who is unique, the Son of God who came lived in the flesh and died on the cross and rose from the dead Mm -hmm. let me see you do it yeah can't do it because you're not god yeah exactly and that's something that they will try to pass off as well is that not just are is mankind ontologically god by nature but they will say touching the incarnation of jesus in particular the incarnation of jesus isn't that much different than your earthly birth and Mm -hmm. his ministry isn't really that significant compared to what you're capable of doing, including his defeat of Satan. Mm -hmm. And there's not really this hard distinction between made between Jesus Christ and us. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the new age movement all the time. And that was such an appeal to me that I can be as Christ. I can become Christ. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised um, in prepping for this podcast to see quotes coming out of word of faith teachers that um, are shocking, that are, are blasphemous, and um, that would render these particular people as being heretics. You can't say this and not be considered a heretic. I was blown away mm-hmm. too, man. Yeah. So here's one. Here's E.W. Kenyon. <sighs> okay. <laughs> God was in Christ, wasn't he? An incarnation. God is in you, an incarnation. If you are born again, you are incarnate. Mm. Here's Kenneth Hagin. You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Every man who has been born again is an incarnation. You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Like, what do we do with that? Yeah. So check this out. But here, once again, where are they getting this from? They're not, not getting the it from, Bible. There's nothing in scripture. They're getting it from revelation knowledge. Here's Kenneth Copeland talking about uh, a conversation he was having with the spirit of God, right? This is good. The spirit of God comes to Kenneth Copeland apparently and says, son, realize this. Now follow me in this and don't let your traditions uh, trip you up here. Mm-hmm. The Spirit said this, think this way, a twice-born man whipped Satan in his own domain. And I threw my Bible like that, and I said, what? He said, a born-again man defeated Satan. The firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image and the very copy of that one. I said, goodness gracious sakes alive, and it just began. I began to see what had gone on in hell. And I said, well, now you don't mean, you don't dare mean that I could have done the same thing. He said, oh yeah, if you'd known that, you had the knowledge of the word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing because you're a reborn man too. So you could have de- defeated Satan in hell just like Jesus did. Um, I do have to say though, this yeah. is like good, but I'm kind of, I still am like kind of like laughing here because you're kind of like going to method actor. Because like, <laughs> <laughs> But the fun thing is they all kind of have that way in which they like talk and make their personalities. Their well, it's very, it's very, yeah. they speak very confidently. Yeah. And very boldly. Yeah. Yeah. And they speak in a way where it's just self-evident. that mm-hmm. this is, It's emotional manipulation. Mm-hmm. When you're preaching the word of God, you don't have to come across a certain way. Because the, the, the when word of God cuts. The word of God cuts. It's the spirit of the ministry mm-hmm. doing his work in his people and in the hearts of unbelievers. You don't have to have this big booming voice. I mean, if you happen to, great. But it's consistent within them. It's very, it's very posturing and very arrogant. Mm-hmm. And here's another one from Kenneth Hagin. We are Christ. Mm-hmm. He's calling the body. God's calling the body, which is the church, Christ. The believer is called Christ. The unbeliever is called Belial. We are one with Christ. 
Therefore, we are Christ. Here's another quote from Kenneth Hagin. Jesus is the head, we are the body. The head and the body are one. A person's head doesn't go by one name and his body by another. People wouldn't call a man's head James and his body Henry. Christ is the head, we are the body. The body of Christ is Christ. So that settles it. I guess that argument settles it. We are Jesus Christ. We're all as much of an incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth was. And, um, of course, that has striking New Age mm-hmm. parallel. Um, I'm gonna, I want to quote for a few quotes here and then get your guys' thoughts on this um, before looking at what the Bible says in particular. But mm-hmm. um, here's a course in miracles. Is he, Jesus, the Christ? Oh, yes, along with you. Mm. Here's Marianne Williamson. Mm-hmm. Accepting the Christ is merely a shift in self-perception. Here's Marianne Williamson again. Even if he takes another name, even if he takes another face, he is, in essence, the truth of who we are. Here's Barbara Marks Hubbard speaking in the place of Jesus. You were born to be me. The church is the body of believers who are conscious of being me. (laughs) Now, the New Age movement would say that um, we can obtain Christ-like status through uh, awakening to our own Mm self-divinity. Now, the method by which we become like Christ in the Word of Faith movement is through the born-again experience, Mm -hmm. right? They would say it's through the born-again experience that we are Christ and that we become an incarnation of Christ. So that doesn't necessarily apply to a person who's not saved. But once you're in Christ, you are just as much an incarnation as a born-again believer as Jesus of Nazareth was. Mm -hmm. So the end game, the principle that they're communicating is still, there's no real distinction. They would say in certain areas, but in some areas, there's little to no distinction between you and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't, I don't even know where you can begin to justify that from the word of God. Um, what, what comes to mind when you, when you hear quotes like that, you're just as much an incarnation as Jesus was. I'd, I'd say if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're being conformed to the image of Christ, where's your repentance? Where's the knowledge of the sin that you have? Where are you wailing over your faults and getting on your knees and praying to the Holy God that you are not worthy? Do you have any idea or, or pounding in your body over the weight of your sin? If you don't, I don't think you know him. There's, there's an aspect of being a Christian to where we are at war with the flesh, the world, and, the, and, and sin, and the, and the devil. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a war, a spiritual war that goes on in every day of the Christian life, but this sounds so flowery and buttery. You already have it. Yeah. yeah. We're already on the other side of glory. Christ is incarnate in you. I'd say, well, where's, where's your battle? Where's your fight? In the book of Revelation, over the first three chapters, Jesus is giving uh, pretty much... He's talking to seven different churches, and in those churches, he talks about victory and overcoming and having this battle. That's it's a present day reality for all Christians, but where is it for them? Mm-hmm. Are they in battle? Well, I, why would we have to be in battle if you know we don't have any struggle? Jesus didn't have any struggle with sin. There was no sin that he needed to conquer in his life. So if we're just as much an incarnation of Jesus, why don't we have this war between the flesh and the spirit? Romans seven, Romans eight. Like, why don't we have this ongoing process? Why do we have an ongoing process of sanctification if Jesus didn't? If we're just as much an incarnation of Jesus, um, you know. Well, don't a lot of teachers sometimes in the New Age, or I mean in in the Word of Faith movement, think that there's sinless perfection? That you can Mm -hmm. obtain, you know, a a life with no sin. Right. And that's the idea behind these teachings, is that they all have this thing in common. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and this is the line where like it pushes out. And like Walter Martin would always talk about this. He listened to his lecture of the health and wealth cult, which is a response. And we may uh, do a couple of quotes from him in the next episode. But um, he talked about when you start toying around now with the divinity of Jesus, and you start going into this area. Mm-hmm. He goes, "You're going from the discernment realm, where someone is theologically off particular areas, and they'd be you could say that they're untrustworthy." Versus when they're making these definitive statements where they're distortions, and you could even argue willfully, of the nature of Jesus. And Jesus gives the standard for eternal life when he says, unless you believe that I am the eternal God, you will die in your sins. For where I am going, you cannot come. And he says, this is eternal life, to know the only true God and and Christ whom we have sent. So when you, when I, when you were saying those quotes, I thought to myself, God forbid I ever say something like that. Mm-hmm. And like, I may I be granted like immediate repentance if I ever tried to say something right. uh, of that nature. And so that's just like the spirit of God is like, like, ah, uh, like alarm bells go off. 
So it, the question would be that it's one thing to be confused on the nature of God, and maybe you can have an inadequate understanding. Like when you know when you first got saved, go up to a new believer and ask them to explain the Trinity. They're probably going to say something that's a little extra or off. So it's one thing to have a misunderstanding of the true God, of the truth, versus an adamant distortion or a willful rejection of that. And another thing I just I thought of too is in First uh, Timothy one seven uh, when he talks about the nature of false teachers, and um, it says desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things in which they make confident assertions. So they're asserting with confidence, but they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, that's in that like that verse. I feel <laughs> like it's one. just emphasized in so much of what Hagen, what Copeland, and what uh, these different uh, people of this movement talk about. Um, and that's that's really the concerning aspect because again, that's where you're looking at going from people that are in error, where they're, they'd be untrustworthy, they wouldn't meet the qualifications biblically to rightly divide the word of truth versus being versus going into cultism, which we would give the definition of a willful uh, misinterpretation of the Bible and mm-hmm. primarily the nature of Jesus. And this is why I just want to emphasize real quick, this is why we, you know, there's a lot of people who listen to our show who are not Christians, who might be atheists or agnostics. You look at people, there's there's episodes, for example, John Oliver. He's a late night uh, talk show host. And there's a couple other people who, who've made mockeries of these prosperity teachers. And they talk about how they want to sow seeds and give money and that sort of stuff. They kind of mock it, but they don't have an ultimate standard by which to judge why is that ultimately wrong. Mm-hmm. And that ulti- this comes from a theology, a distortion of scripture. They'll take verses and they'll twist them, which the Bible also I mean, talks about people who make confident, confident assertions, but it also warns about those who will twist the scriptures to their own destruction and other people's destruction. So you have, we have to be able to have an assertive standard by which to judge these people. And if you're trying to approach this without beginning with the presupposition of God being the arbiter of truth and his word being the standard, you can, you can cry out that these people were wronged or they're, or they're being, you know, they're, they're being robbed out of their money or out of their paycheck because they're trying to sow seeds and whatnot. But you can't give an ultimate, you can't really give an accounting as to why they are doing that or why these people were victimized is wrong, but we do as Christians. Mm-hmm. And that, that's just an important thing to note. But um, this is really good. I feel like we've only started to grasp the surface of this. So we are going to jump into a part two. We're going to try and get as many episodes as we can before, because uh, who knows what we will be, who knows what who knows what will be like when part two comes out. <laughs> so everyone just uh, I hope that you are all uh, wherever you are, please stay safe. Um, and we obviously know that God is, God is in control and we appreciate you listening to this episode. It's very, very uh, relevant and share this with someone share this episode with someone that, you know, there's probably a lot of people that are confused right now and hurting and hopefully uh, something that we said right here may give them some rethinking of, that uh, of how they view how they should view the world right now also right now obviously right now there's a lot of uncertainty in the world however this uh show cannot go on without your financial support so for those of you who are part of the culture's crew we're very grateful for that um if you please consider donating helping this program to continue right now especially just you know during times of crises and 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 uncertainty is when cultish movements really start to boil up because people want to find hope and certainty during uh, uncertain times. So we really need your support so we can continue this ministry. Go to the cultistshow.com, go to the donate tab. You can donate one time or monthly help this program to continue. So all that being said, we'll talk to you guys next time on cultish with Steven and Melissa. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. Talk to you soon.